Um, uh, the uh, intention of this lecture is to give you a kind of tiny overview about the uh, uh, studies which were done in respect to treating terminally ill or uh, people with life-threatening diseases with uh, the psychedelics. What is the history? What are the concepts? And what are the recent developments in that field? And I thought it, was a, it would be appropriate to give you a short overview about that because it seems to me that this is the step which is the next one in respect to therapeutic applications of the psychedelics. And there are some projects uh, already going on and I was marginally involved uh, with one of them. Okay, I will present about these uh, kind of chapters. As I told you, there are some methodological problems with these studies, which I will go into. But uh, first, um, you know that death was kind of excluded from reality in a way, so the people were, which were dying are not dying into the, in the family as in the former times. They were kind of excluded to hospitals and to intensive care units, etc. So that uh, kind of part of reality, which is an essential one, uh, even honored by shamans and uh, in the traditional cultures. Um, and uh, so therefore we could say that death became uh, context decontextualized means uh, it uh, was uh, thrown out of the usual matrix of human existence. Um, and the attitudes about death in the dying are mainly apathy, denial, and withdrawal. And this also counts for uh, the relatives of a death, uh, dying person. So the people try usually to avoid that kind of person and put them into kind of isolation. Maybe that's because of suppressing the uh, idea of uh, death and, and the reality of death and denying that. And so they don't want to go into contact because they are not accustomed to, right? And, but uh, during the 1970s, a kind of movement came up uh, to let people die with dignity. So take much more care than caring about a technical failure, right? as death can be seen also by the technological uh, technology of medicine. So, and so an upcoming of the quality of life issues for the dying and the relatives was coming up during the 70s, and in that phase, the beginning of the, these uh, studies uh, can be dated. So usually, if you have a life-threatening illness, there are some phases, mainly characterized by Kübler-Ross, uh, which you may go through during the, uh, during the process of metabolizing the uh, life-threatening illness and the consequences of it. Uh, the first phase is denial and isolation so that the people don't talk about it, they don't realize it themselves, they sometimes make illusions or suppress these insights coming from that and uh, how, how ill they are. And uh, also sometimes anger, anger may come up uh, like, um, oh, what has God done to me? Is it is not justice, etc., etc., and also envy and resentment, also bargaining, depression may be part of your confrontation with a life-threatening illness, as well as at last acceptance. And if you look at the process, it seems that especially during these phases, uh, you can help with counseling and psychotherapy, but the people are going through these phases usually anyway, as it seems. Not all of them, but a lot of them also come to acceptance even without counseling or psychedelics, etc. So this is what Lawrence Lechan, a prominent physician, told us about his work with the dying. You see that these people are kind of uh, lost in the situation. And so you know that shamans are doing uh, contacts with the uh, realm of the dead, right? The ecstatic voyage into that kind of realm beyond the usual reality into the realm of the dead, especially in the African uh, cultures. This is uh, another kind of evidence for that approach is that the Tibetan Book of the Death was translated in a way and in a psychological fashion 
uh, edited by Leary and Metzner and Alpert as a guide for uh, going through the psychedelic experiences. So there may be a kind of relationship. I will later come back to that. So how did they discover the possibility to give the dying a psychedelic drug? So that was a kind of discovery by chance, because at a specific point of time during the 1950s, an anesthesiologist was doing studies on pain medications. And he used some opiates and also, he wanted to use, because he was an intelligent person, an active placebo in the people which received the placebo, right? So he chose from his knowledge, okay, let's give them a little dose of LSD to irritate them, right? So that they think they got something, but it's not working on pain, right? Okay? So, but what he found was they got less pain and better mood, even better than the other ones. But this is an after effect, it's not during the acute effect, right? So, and he theorized about that, that they got defocused because of the LSD effect from the pain perception. So usually, if I would put a needle in you somewhere, you, your attention would be focused there, right, completely. So if you could defocus from that pain focus, then you may be in a better state, right? And that could hold on for quite a while. And he also found decreased anxiety about death. So it was a miracle for him. What happened to these people? They, they got a kind of irritating drug and then they got better in this strange fashion. And so what he found when he interviewed the people was that their frame of references, reference regarding death was changing. And he also found some kind of spiritual effects like religious experience, they encountered God or something like that. So he was really irritated at first but later on, and this was his conclusion about the state of the patients. And so he found it could be quite productive to give them a kind of mentally irritating drug. So um, some other pioneers in the field, Kast has done some further studies with counseling, without counseling, etc., but I don't, can't go too much into it. And Aldous Huxley was getting knowledge out of that, and you may know that he got injected in the moment of death with 100 mics of LSD by his wife, and he was always uh, doing a plaidoyer for this idea to give patients uh, in the process of dying a psychedelic drug. Another very prominent but mainly forgotten researcher, I really want to focus you on that guy, uh, Sidney Cohn, he was a very early person in LSD research. He was, in fact, the inventor of the psychedelic paradigm in the field. Um, and he gave uh, some exploratory treatments to some very few patients, let's say five or something. It's not exactly numbered in the publication. And he gave them a little music and compassionate guidance throughout the experience but he had no focus on the peak experience. Some of these patients, it seems, had a kind of peak experience, and that was his conclusion from his studies. And he was kind of confirmed, but he didn't, uh, uh, he didn't uh, conduct further studies. So then you may know the Maryland group, Bill Richards, who was, uh, will be present in the evening uh, by Skype, uh, was part of it, and also the prominent Walter Pankey, who has done uh, studies about uh, LSD or psilocybin and the mystical experience, and uh, another prominent member of that group uh, was Stanislav Grof, as well as the still living Bill Richards, who is leading the uh, treatment studies with the terminally ill in Baltimore still today. And what did they do? They refined the approach it was interestingly that one of the staff members of the psychedelic therapy work groups in uh, Maryland had a cancer, a breast cancer, metastatic breast cancer, so she was going to die. And so they came up with that idea, oh, let's use Cohen's approach to try to do something for her. And they at last refined the psychotherapeutic treatment. They had more the intention to induce psychedelic experiences because they thought they may help more than only the usual, you could say, kind of experiences you experience during a psychedelic trip. 
And they used much more higher doses than Cohen and the other guys. They were around 100, and they are more. It was kind of 100 uh, mic, uh, micro, uh, milligrams of DPT also. And they used the more the psychedelic procedure mainly uh, in respect to the power of music so that you will be guided with music throughout the whole trip. You have eye shades, you have headphones, and you were going through the whole experience powered and amplified by the use of music. Uh, and they focused on getting the people an exper uh, peak experience and cathartic experiences, mainly uh, emotional abreaction, having psychological insights in the dynamics of the situation or in their life, right? So the general procedure was that they medically screened the patients. They had to have a lifespan of three months or a little more. And they had psychological preparation, building a relationship of uh, trust. And they had session one and session two usually. And they had integration work afterwards, speaking with the people and going through what they experienced. And some further psychotherapy afterwards. So the psychological procedure, I mentioned that especially because usually at that point of time their patients had no informed consent. So they had no procedure where they gave in to the procedure and they were well informed about what will happen. But they have done that and they established a relationship of uh, trust and they discussed explicitly some personal issue, uh, issues and conflicts, especially in the interpersonal sphere with their relatives, what kind of problems are still there, et cetera, et cetera. And they also were going into the topic, how can you accept the, the disease and the procedure which will, or the, the process which will be induced by uh, going to die. So this is one of these uh, kind of settings, what they have there, that there is a uh, maybe old, older ther therapist, a person is lying down and going into the experience, maybe usually having eye shade, there will be a guide there, a kind of nurse or something like that. And uh, I will give you an idea about the process from that quote, from some quotes from the first patient they have treated, right? So that was without any prejudice, if you want so. Well, that was part of the experience. And I will give you an idea about, this is a person on LSD from that Oppert book. Also Cohen was, and these are, these may be a kind of vision you experience during that kind of journey. So this is part of the process too, maybe. This is kind of exemplary for these patients. And so you may be not only in a state of ecstasy, you may be also in a state of grief. And, and And so in a way, this is a kind of exemplar, uh, example which is kind of typical for the process maybe. And so these guys found a kind of sequence which is going on during these uh, sessions. And that is at first usually anxiety about the process and about d dying, then a kind of purgation, which was uh, included in one of the quotes. And then a kind of psychological death may follow, that you're completely in despair, that your ego may be lost, whatever. And a kind of NDE experience, near-death experience may happen. Maybe only parts of it may come up. And also a peak experience can happen, so that you're kind of going into a mystical kind of consciousness or state. But also catharsis and a feeling of rebirth afterwards may happen, and maybe a typical uh, uh, part of it. And uh, the, they found that one thing is that the people were in a better state afterwards, they were more clear, they had a better mood, they were more accepting what's happened. And they also found mainly that their relationships, they let the family in after the session was closed, right? And so they could speak much more openly and honestly, honestly about all the topics which are 
maybe it didn't have been resolved before and so therefore a major change in the relationship was relationships was found and some after effects which were quite long ranging and what's about the results i can give you only an idea about that interestingly the maryland group had different raters right they had the physician rating the person who was not involved in the psychotherapy and counseling he was only the physician uh, doing the cancer treatment and the counselor was interviewed, the family members, the closest family members, and also the nurses were involved with giving ratings on scales, right? So that you get a kind of objective picture how the patient is right now or later. So what they found is decreased depression and anxiety. The depression uh, measures were significant. Increased relaxation, compliance, and intimacy. The, uh, the ability to have intimate contact, that was the most significant parameter they measured with more openness and honesty. And as far as they could say, 20% improved dramatically, 40% improved somewhat or moderately, and the other ones didn't have anything out of the experience. So think about that too. So and here, to give you an idea, this is a, a so-called mini M MMPI uh, multiphasic uh, Minnesota Multifacetic Personality Inventory, and uh, you can see these are kind of, you could say, psychopathological dimensions of a personality, and this was the state uh, before they under, uh, have undergone the therapeutic work, and here you can see it bettered, even with only that short process, quite a lot in these psychopathological measures. They were going down, it means more healthy. So, what are the recent developments in, with these approaches? Um, some recent projects are going on with Charlie Grobe, who has already finished a study in, uh, the, at the University of California in Los Angeles with uh, psilocybin uh, and treat the treatment of some terminally ill, which we are really dying afterwards. There's also a very impressive example in the movie uh, Inside LSD, which you may look up at uh, the YouTube website. And this was already finished and published in the most high-ranking uh, psychiatric journal. And another study was performed by Peter Gasser from Switzerland. And he was treating mainly people with life-threatening illnesses, which is a different deal than a terminal illness, right? It's only life-threatening, but you may survive, right? And I will give you some results of that, too. Uh, there was uh, marginally, I was... Uh, involved with that. So that was the first therapeutic study with LSD since 40 years. And another study is uh, happening at uh, the uh, University of New York with uh, Jeff Gus and uh, Stephen Ross as a major investigator uh, it is, uh, using psilocybin in terminal cancer patients. And they, the parody, paradigms changed a little. So Drop and Gusser were using more psychotherapeutic sessions uh, usually they used a couple at the sessions, so there was a female and a male, and they used kind of medium dosages. This was also because of compromising with the IRBs, so it's not only their intention. But with the LSD study, it was 200 mics, and it was, that was by intention. It wasn't too high so that you have to go into a peak experience or into an anxiety reaction. So we thought a medium range kind of, a little above the medium range would be quite appropriate. Uh, but they used not as much music. They were more in talking with the people and letting them meditatively uh, ruminate about their situation. And they focused more on psychodynamics or sociodynamics if you want to uh, have the relationships in there. And they had no focus on the peak experience. So and I will give you some idea about the results so the light is not appropriate so I can only so this is a STI index, which is a kind of questionnaire which gives you an idea in what, uh, how much anxiety a person has right now and how much anxiety vulnerable that person is in general. So this is about the state, the actual state of anxiety. And here you see the placebo group. Okay, they have gotten 25 micrograms of LSD, and these were the 200 mics people, so they got much more decrease in anxiety. This is a measure, you have a specific realm, it doesn't mean that you can be here, 
the usual people are here, okay? So it was going down quite a, quite a little, and there was an open label phase two. It means if you got the placebo at the first time, then you had the opportunity to, get, to later get the LSD, and you see that these people who got the LSD later on, they had also some treatment success, and the long-term follow-up is giving here, so it's much less than initially uh, in respect to the anxiety, to the state anxiety. And astonishingly enough, we had also measured the trait anxiety means the personality traits, how anxious you are in general, as a, require, as a prerequisite, if you want. And we found also a non-significant but a strong trend that this trait will be changed through LSD, as you can see here, and it's also even better in the long range, right? Oh, that is kind of interesting. So I'm coming to the end of the lecture. Um, some methodological issues are involved with that kind of research. And one is an ethical problem with a control group. It means if you have terminal patients and you need some weeks to conduct two sessions, some people may have died already before you could give them the real thing. Yeah, before you could give them the real thing, right? So that's not quite appropriate to do it that way. So you promise them something and then you give them a placebo and they don't get anything. So that's a kind of ethical dile dilemma, if you want to. And also, one problem was you can't do really a good control group, right? Giving them kind of nothing or only counseling and giving the other uh, uh, worstful treatment. And so they, the patients in the former study served as their own controls. So you measure them before the sessions and afterwards, right? But that's a problem from a scientific point of view. Usually you have to have parallel groups, right? One with the treatment, one without it, and then appropriate numbers. And also you have in unclear intervening variables. For example, you may be left by your wife when you're dying. So you can't measure that, which could ma have a major impact on your state, right? So that is an unclear thing with some of these variables. Especially problematic is the course of the illness. For example, in that LSD study, there was one person who had breast cancer. Uh, one person had a metastatic uh, diagnosis afterwards during the treatment. They were getting less good, right? And the other one had a diagnosis, yo, no, you don't have any cancer anymore. So she was going up, better, you know, but not through the treatment. So how do you account for that? It's not easy, right? So the course of the illness itself may interfere with your results. It can be a big problem. So you have to have much more numbers to have a valid result at last. And also, <laughs> yeah, I'm serious. You know, if you have an addicted person, you know, you can do it for 10 years, or a person going out of prison because of a therapeutic work, and did he come back 10 years later or not? But you can't do that with that, right? So what will be the future of that approach or these kind of treatments? So uh, the uh, group at Johns Hopkins, I only mention Richards here because he's an old veteran from the older years. At Johns Hopkins, they are doing a study right now which they have treated kind of 30 patients up to now as far as I know. And Ross and Gus at NYU, they are doing an ongoing study right now with this kind of approach. And Gasser in Switzerland, so the guy who has done the LSD study, he got a permission for using LSD in a compassionate use fashion. It means they give, you, give him permission to treat some patients which are really into a bad state, and, but he don't, don't have to do scientific work on that. He only can give it to them as a treatment. And it seems that a group in the US will try to bring through psilocybin as an appropriate prescription medicine to be used in terminal patients or patients with life-threatening disease. And a guy called Michael Lucien in Geneva is uh, preparing a study to do in this, uh, with this approach. And another development recently is that uh, people were treated in respect to their fear of death, not that they are really dying, you know. So that could be a different approach to have people which have an illness and they fear to die, and you try to reduce their anxiety with that kind of treatment. 
And uh, I add, may add that the effects of MDMA may be useful too. There was an intent to do a study during the late 80s by Charlie Grobe at UCLA. And also there was a recent approach to, to try to do a study at Harvard with MDMA in terminal cancer patients, but only two patients were treated. They battered a lot, by the way. But that stop, uh, study was stopped then. And there, uh, at, the, at my last uh, slide, I will give you an idea, because kind of what I found out is that there are some features of the near-death experience which are identical to a psychedelic experience. Partially your kind of life review, the seeing the light, having a mystical experience, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of parallels, kind of. And so we know that if people have had a near-death experience, then afterwards they confront death in another way. And they have less anxiety, less fear of death, and they have a more, much more appropriate state in confronting a terminal illness. So even if that near-death experience was kind of 10 years ago or something, Right? So there are kind of after effects. And if you look that both experiences may strongly alter your conscious experiences, you may confront related kind of experiences, even confrontations with parts of your biography, etc. And to metabolize that, similar confrontations and catharsis you see in both conditions and virtually identical after effects even in respect to better attitudes, et cetera, and more tolerance and so on. Thanks for your attention.